It's the Pain Exam Podcast with your host, David Rosenblum, MD. If you treat pain or have an interest in pain management, join us as we discuss painful disorders, alternative treatments, practice management, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Pain Exam newsletter at painexam.com and review the podcast on Stitcher or iTunes. Our high-yield premium episodes are now available on the Pain Exam app with a premium subscription or access for free with a CME subscription at painexam.com. And now, without further ado, here's your host, Dr. Rosenblum. Welcome back. It's the week of April 11th, 2023, and I'm getting ready for my trip to West Virginia. Never been there, but... um, I was invited to give a talk on ultrasound in the pain practice. So I'm going to discuss integration of the ultrasound and how it can get you out of some tight spaces. For instance, you did um, knee treatments, genicular nerve blocks, PRP, visco, et cetera, and the patient's still in pain. What's left? So using the ultrasound to target peripheral neuromodulation therapy or to perform superficial geniculars and uh, much more, such as lyophoromacutaneous nerve, which has also been the target of either ablative therapies or peripheral neuromodulation. So it's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm going to also be at Aspen. Um, I was invited to be faculty there, and I'm hoping to go this Miami. However, um, I just need to check with the scheduling and uh, whether or not I go or not, you should go. It's a great conference. Um, I go every year pretty much. And it's not only great education, it's also a lot of fun, great for networking. And I think there's going to be an international ASPN meeting in Dubai this December, which I hope to be at. So a lot of cool stuff coming up. On my platform, we have the Regenerative Medicine course in May, May 13th, and the board review course for pain physicians or refresher course for those of you who just want to update your knowledge on pain management with myself and Dr. Al Abdul Saeed in June in New York City. And if you can't make it in person, you can catch the Zoom. And of course, we have the monthly ultrasound courses. And uh, I hope to see you there and the board review, of course. Anyway, today's podcast is going to combine two of my passions. The first is, of course, ultrasound. The second is regenerative medicine. And um, I found a really cool article. And this article is a case report entitled Ultrasound Guided Cervical Intradiscal Injection with PRP with Fluoroscopic Validation for the Treatment of Cervical Discogenic Pain, a Case Presentation and Technical Illustration by Dr. Lam, Dr. Hung, and Dr. Wu. And basically, they, 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 they did something that I've always thought about doing, which was using the ultrasound to access the cervical disc uh, and deposit PRP there. So in my journal search this morning, I came across this article, which has some cool pictures as well. It's not just a description. It has the images so you could see what they did. And it's actually... It's a lot like doing the lateral approach to the stellate ganglion. If you do ultrasound, you know what I'm talking about. And they just turn the probe 90 degrees to get into the disc. So basically, they have a 58-year-old woman with chronic neck pain. VAS is 6 to 7 and tightness for several years. And neck pain was stronger on the left and would radiate to the interscapular region. Six months prior, she gradually developed left shoulder pain, which worsened and became an 8 to to 9 out of 10 at night. She underwent 16 sessions of physical therapy with limited improvement. On physical exam, the range of motion of the neck was 45 degrees for left rotation, for left side bending, 60 degrees for right rotation, and right side bending, 30 degrees for flexion, and 35 degrees for extension. Local tenderness over the left cervical power spinal muscle, longus coli, and longus capitis muscles were noted. The physical examination of the left shoulder was normal except mild snapping during repeated internal and external rotations. The neurological examination revealed slightly diminished pinprick sensations over the left C6 and C7 dermatones. 
The neck disability index was 40% moderate disability at baseline and 50% severe disability at most severe times. The shoulder pain disability index, the SPADI, was 55% and baseline and 70% during more painful uh, at nighttime sleep. MRI of the left shoulder was normal. The MRI of the cervical spine revealed C5, 6, C6, C6, 7 desiccated discs and a broad-based posterior protrusion, slightly more prominent over the left. When the treatment options were discussed, the patient refused transframmal epidural steroid injection for fear of side effect of steroids. Instead, she opted to receive ultrasound guide provocative discography in combination with a possible intra- PRP intradiscal injection. Provocative discography was, with contrast was performed to the C5-6 and C6-7 discs under ultrasound guidance with fluoroscopic confirmation. When the contrast was injected to the C5-6 and C6-7 discs, part of the shoulder pain was provoked, not surprisingly. And this covered exactly all the painful spots that she complained of. Afterwards, PRP, and they used... Um, uh, w- mixed with 0.1% lidocaine was injected to each level, and the injection eliminated the shoulder pain of the patient. So, first of all, mixing lidocaine with PRP. Well, they only use 0.1%, which is pretty low, right? We use 1% or 2%. So that's like a tenth of our lower dose. I advocate not to mix local with PRP, but I suppose there probably is a con a concentration where it might be okay. I need to further investigate this and let you know. As far as I know, I've never mixed local anesthetic with PRP. Now, when it comes to contrast, I did look at data and there was conflicting. Um, it was it was concentration based when um, people mix contrast with the PRP. If they use lower concentrations, the theory is going to have less of a risk of in- interfering with the PRP. The other thing is not even just the chemical interference. You don't want to dilute your PRP too much, right? Because then it won't work as well. Um, anyway, so no procedure complications were reported. Three weeks after the procedure, the neck pain had significantly improved to zero to one. The range of motion of the neck was 7 degrees for the left rotation, 60 degrees for left side bending, almost 90 degrees for right rotation, and 70 degrees for right side bending. The flexion was 45 degrees and the extension was 50 degrees. The NDI was 20%. The SPADI was also 20% after the injection. So the patient had some some good outcomes, uh, had a good outcome so far. Um, In terms of performing the ultrasound-guided cervical injection, the patient was placed supine. And they had a towel under the neck, a small pillow under the upper back to hyperextend the neck and open up the anterior intervertebral space. The physician was seated on the patient's symptomatic side, and antibiotics, uh, ANSEF, was given IV before the procedure. A scout scanning was performed by placing high-frequency linear transducer in the transverse uh, plane on the lateral aspect of the neck. A C6 vertebral level was identified as the most caudate cervical vertebra that had both anterior and posterior tubercles of the transverse process, while C7 only has a posterior tubercle. Remember that, right? C7 only has a posterior tubercle. The prominent C6 anterior tubercle, otherwise known as Chastnex tubercle, was the landmark, rotating the transducer in the long axis of the neck and sliding toward the midline. The intervertebral disc was visualized as the gaps between each vertebral bony cortex. The intervertebral disc distal to Chastnex tubercle was C6-7 and proximal was C5-6. The physician then placed the center of the transducer at the target level of the intervertebral disc and marked a horizontal line for entry. And I'm just reading this from the text. You guys can look at this yourself. Uh, I don't think they mentioned needle-through-needle technique, which is what I do to keep it extra sterile and safe. So they also use the ultrasound to avoid the vascular structures, neural structures, and hydrodissected with 5% dextrose to push away the um, interjugular vein, internal jugular vein. And they use dual split display with one in power Doppler mode used to visualize the critical vascular structures with attention, especially focused on the vertebral artery, of course. After the needle reached the annulus fibrosis, the transducer was rotated to the long axis of the neck to check the needle position out of plane and perform fine adjustments to enter the disc. 
When the needle was inside the disc, the needle could be uh, needle placement could be validated with poking technique under in-plane, out-of-plane ultrasound imaging. And there's a video. It demonstrated the in-plane lateral to medial approach of the ultrasound guide intradiscal injection with the transducer placed in the short axis of the spine. After the needle reached the annulus fibrosis, the transducer was rotated to the long axis of the cervical spine to check the needle position out of plane. Further validation could be achieved by injecting the contrast and visualizing the spread of contrast under fluoroscopy. The patient should feel concordant pain during the injection. The PRP was then injected to the center of the disc in a volume of 0.5 to 1 ml. Typically, we use low, small, smaller volumes of PRP in the cervical spine. And they have a nice picture of how they did this in illustration, as well as images, ultrasound, and fluoroscopic image in the text. And um, so this patient did pretty well. Um, and they're describing um, their uh, ultrasound-assisted cervical discography is a technique from um, Samar Naruz, who many of you probably know. And I think this is a great article. Um, they did mention that they uh, advocate, some people advocate going from the right side to avoid the esophagus on the left. However, their technique um, demonstrated that you could do the left side without risking the esophagus using ultrasound. Now, I do have a video I'm going to be displaying this at my courses and my West Virginia talk and hopefully at Aspen, in which you have a patient swallowing under ultrasound, and you can actually see the esophagus come into visual interview. So um, the ultrasound, in my opinion, is a must when doing these neck procedures, um, like a stellate ganglion, for instance, and I think it's going to increase the safety with a cervical discogram or disc injection. Um, the complications, um, you know, the real risk to the disc is um, discitis, of course, one of the discs. And I, w I guess I would just be cautious, um, just when you're using ultrasound, just make sure that you, you're obviously sterile technique. Also, try to minimize, even though it's sterile, the needle exposure to the gel. I'm sure it's okay, but who knows, right? We don't want to take a chance of any of the gel getting into the area of the disc. That's why I would advocate anytime you do a discogram, especially if you're using an ultrasound and there's going to be ultrasound jelly, use the needle through needle technique to avoid any possible reaction or infection. Anyway, um, I hope you found this interesting because I did. Um, I'll have a link to the show notes and I'm inspired to take some ultrasound images of my patients or my own discs to show you guys at my next course. Once again, Board Review June, Board Review Online, as well as my Regenerative Medicine course May 13th and monthly ultrasound courses. Come visit me in New York. Have a great day and good luck. Dr. Rosenblum is here solely to educate and you are solely responsible for all your decisions and actions in response to any information contained herein. These podcasts are not intended as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician to a particular patient or specific ailment. You should regularly consult a physician in matters relating to yours or another's health. You understand that this podcast is not intended as a substitute for consultation with a licensed medical professional. Copyright 2017, David Rosenblum, all rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced stored in a retrieval system or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, recording, or otherwise, without the prior written permission of the author.